I'm a big perfectionist. I'm a Virgo. I'm We're letting go of perfectionism <laughs> in 2024. Perfectionism okay. is out. <laughs> Today is a special guest because not only is she a really good friend of mine, she's been a massive inspiration to me and so many other people. On today's pod, we have Laura Dundevik. We'll be chatting about her experience as Miss Universe, how being in the public eye impacted her relationship with herself, her journey with Hashimoto's disease, and what she does to feel her best. Welcome back to Self Dom Beautiful Humans. Now, let's dive into the episode. Laura is known for a whole variety, but a little bit of a backstory. In 2008, she won Miss Universe Australia, which kicked off her career in fashion, acting, and the works. Laura has a Cert 3 and 4 in PT, as well as a Bachelor in Psychology. She really embodies beauty and brains. What I love about Laura is that she shares her struggles and her vulnerabilities on her gram, and it's not just all butterflies and roses. Laura, welcome to Self Dom. Hey, Tommy. It's so nice having an intro from a friend. I'm a little bit emotional. <laughs> oh, my God. I know, and I didn't... I, I didn't tell you what I was going to say, but I no. did a bit of my research, which was nice. <laughs> Learned some things. I love that. That's so cute. Thank you. So I wanted to dive straight into the episode and talk about your Miss Universe experience. It was a dream of mine when I was younger to be Miss Universe. So the fact that we're friends now, I'm just like, oh my God, in <laughs> awe. So I wanted to know, how did this experience impact the trajectory of your career and your life in general? Look, to be honest, for me, it happened so quickly. I was modelling at the time and my agent said I should enter and it was within that I had the Miss Universe New South Wales the next day, the Miss Australia pageant the next week. No. And my first ever beauty pageant, Miss Universe, three weeks later. I didn't know this. Yeah, it was crazy. So it, I didn't really have time to, and you know me, like I'm a bit of a tomboy. So for me, it wasn't like something that I was like, oh, I want to do Miss Universe. I'd obviously modelled. Um, but I hadn't watched a pageant before. So for me, it happened so quickly. I didn't know where anything was going. I went on a holiday with my family straight after um, to Croatia and I came back and I went straight into working um, as my year as Miss Universe Australia. And I guess it all kind of changed from there, but it wasn't planned. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I was in my, my third year of um, psychology at the time. And with psychology, you really need to do a fourth year. So you need to either do your honours or a postgrad. And so I was really trying to get into honours honours. So I was in the middle of my um, third year exams. So I was like stressed. I wasn't well at the time. I had all the work on top of it. So it was a lot to deal with. Obviously you were saying that you were a tomboy. So did it kind of cross your mind? Do I do this or do I not? Or was it a definite yes? I... When I'm with an agent that I love, I always try to take their guidance. Uh, but my mum had actually been asked to do Miss Universe when she was younger. So my mum modelled as well and she met my dad. And I don't know if the rules are still the same, but she couldn't be engaged at the time and she ended up getting engaged to dad. So she never did it and regretted it. And so mum was like, please just do it for me. And I was like, okay. So I sort of did it for my mum really. And do you feel like that Miss Universe experience kind of jump-started your career? Are you grateful that you did it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's one of those things where I guess my life could have gone in two completely different paths. Like, and that was, a, I guess, like a sliding doors moment. Have you seen that movie? No. Okay, you know, I right. haven't seen any movie. <laughs> it's a really good, very old movie. You'd love it. But it's just like my life could have taken one of two paths and it went down one path. I'll never know what the other path was, but I love travel, as do you, and the things that I've seen, I love meeting new people. I remember when I was young, I changed schools and mum was worried about all of us kids and I, like, walked in and I was like, oh, my gosh, all new friends and I've always been that person that loves meeting new people and I get to do that constantly and I get to travel and that for me has been the biggest blessing, so... I love it. Well, I feel like that rolls on to the next question because you've obviously been in the public eye a lot, which means you get to meet new people all the time. It sounds super positive. But I wanted to know how did you manage always being in the spotlight, especially, you know, for that year and the years after? I think, to be honest, like I did a, um, a lot of public speaking. So a lot of the time I get asked if I'm media trained. I was never media trained, but I did a lot of public speaking and debating at school. I was the cool kid. Um, <laughs> so speaking in front of a camera was never difficult for me. So that part of the public eye 
really didn't bother me. I really don't like paparazzi. I really, like it, it triggers me, that part of well, it. Well, we've been at the beach before and you're like, don't post that we're here until we leave. Yes. And I can see like it's something that stays with you. It's like a PTSD now. It is. And like we were having this conversation last night. It's like a lot of the time you don't see someone with a camera following you. It's just somebody following you. And that doesn't make me feel good. Um, so that part of the public eye, I really don't like. Um, and the other thing I don't like is how it can affect other people. So say, for example, like I'm quite private with my relationships and I like to respect what I have slash what I have had with someone. And so if you have a breakup, it's not necessarily that that person's a bad person or that you're a bad person, you just didn't work. And sometimes you'll have a breakup and I'm not even finish processing the emotions and I've got my phone blowing off because 20 people have read about it online and they're asking if you're okay or what happened or you know and they've always the article will always sort of have like a a lean to it of like Laura dumps or Laura gets dumped or Mm. and that part of it I don't want to hurt someone and it I don't like that yeah I totally understand that I feel like you've dealt with it amazingly and Mm. I I wanted to kind of see if your psychology degree do you feel like having that experience in psychology has helped you in ways of managing being in the public eye or judgment or whatever whatever it may be I definitely think it it helped me in a sense of I mean, when I, when I did Miss Universe, I look at myself and I was like, I was a baby. So a lot of it's been growing, but I think having that like psychology, psychological awareness has helped me definitely navigate through all of that. Um, I think one of the most important things that it does is it reminds me, which you're wonderful at, but like to be mindful and it's, it's very easy with, especially me being, I'm a big perfectionist. I'm a Virgo. I'm We're letting go of perfectionism <laughs> in 2024. Perfectionism okay. is out. <laughs> out. But I, for me, I want everything to be perfect and that's the thing. So sometimes I can get really caught up in that. And I remember the whole Miss Universe process. I mean, I'm away with... 80 different girls from all these different countries and I'm there focusing on, oh, you know, what's going here and am I going to do well or whatnot? And I'm like, when will I ever experience this again? And so, so many times just having that awareness of being mindful, I bring myself back to situations where, you know, I might be stressing about something and I think, you know what, Laura, you're on the other side of the world with an amazing group of people, focus on that. Um, and so that I've, I think that's definitely been really important. And then just a lot of my knowledge about, I remember my first ever psychology lesson, we learned that our brain is a storyteller. And so we all think that what we believe is truth, but really it's just a part of our imagination. And that's painted by how we grew up, what our beliefs were growing up. And so we're sitting here doing this podcast and you and I could have, if someone asks what happened and you're a bit quiet today, I could leave. And if I have a really negative self-talk, I can leave and think, Dom doesn't like me. Nobody likes me. Everyone doesn't like me. And But I could also think, I hope Dom's okay and reach out to you. But the way that I act is going to affect our friendship, our relationship, my work, whatnot. Um, So I choose to pick the happiest scenario in everything. And that's something I have to remind myself. I was not born like that. But if somebody's a little bit funny, if, you know, work doesn't go how it was, you know, you want it to. Like say you don't get a job. Rather than thinking I'm not good enough and, you know, nobody wants me, okay, their budgets mightn't be great. You know, the brand mightn't be doing as well. There are so many different things that happen. So they're things that I'm aware of that definitely help me. Yeah, and I absolutely love the statistic that 85% of your thoughts never happen. Yeah. And it's like we spend probably 99% of our life just thinking of scenarios that never happen and it's like what's the point? And I love that your psychology degree has like catapulted that positive mindset in you and I also love that you remind yourself because it is a journey and a big thing that I like to reinforce is that it's a practice every day. Yeah. And every day you can start. Definitely. And every day you can see the glass half full. And you need to do it every day. And yeah. it's like it's one of those things where it's like we go to the gym, you know, we move our bodies every day, we watch what we're eating. But for some reason it's like I love now that we have so much more psychological awareness but 
back in the day, it was something you just didn't talk about. You wouldn't say to a friend, hey, I'm not coping, I'm really down. Um, and that's what's great. Like Dom and I will have our sauna sessions yeah. when one of us isn't <laughs> well. She'll be the one to like, you know, she's not great or I'm not great. She'll be like, come over and have a sauna. And yeah. we just get straight into it. And I think it's something that's so nice in our generation that we can do that. Yeah, it's the honesty box and if you're crying, you're sweating so you don't even know, no one needs to know, you know. <laughs> That's I honestly feel like I have my best conversations with my friends in the sauna. Yeah, it is. So a I, she's, you are a machine in the sauna. <laughs> I'm working up to it. Dom will be in there for like, I don't know how long you're in there for, but I have to go out and have breaks, I air, and then I hear her go, shut the door so I don't let any of the cool air in. I'm I know, come I'm very back. strict with my sauna. I don't <laughs> yeah. want any cold air getting in there. So I wanted to kind of touch on this idea of confidence. Mm-hmm. You ooze confidence and as you said, you've been on a journey. I wanted to know some tips that you would give someone if they're lacking confidence and wanted to find it. I think the thing with confidence is I guess – the way that I learned probably quite young and that's the thing that when people say to me, if you had a daughter, would you let her model? I would. I learned so much through that process. Um, and for me, the biggest thing that I had to learn was at the age of 16 and that's a really hard age to learn it, but was the difference between self-esteeming and other esteeming. And basically self-esteem is, you know, taking that confidence in yourself and being okay, but other esteeming is needing other people. And so with modeling, you would go to, I'd have to go to say 10 castings in a day and I'd walk in a room and the first room they'd be like, oh my gosh, you're amazing. Call everyone over, look at me. And I'd walk out thinking that I was wonderful. I'd walk into the next room and they wouldn't even look at me. They'd literally just go, thank you. And out I'd go. And I'd see a girl in the lobby that in my eyes was more attractive than me. And I'd start picking myself to pieces because I Mm. wasn't what she was. And then I'd feel horrible. And then I'd go to the next casting and based on how that person made me feel is how I felt about myself. And that's a horrible place to be in. And take that away from the modeling industry. You're dating a guy and the guy doesn't treat you well. That's nothing to say about your worth. And so for me, I place a lot of um, importance. Like other people, I'm, I'm like, if I'm a tree, I'm solid. Other people's comments and opinions do not, do not affect me. I How I feel about myself is most important. So I'm hard on myself in a sense of, You know, I really, I look after myself. I look after my body. I am careful of what I consume in terms of things that I watch or, you know, things that people I hang out with, all of that sort of thing. But from that, I like who I am as a person. And it's taken me years to be able to say that, but I'm proud of who I am. And if someone does say something, it's not, you know, mean about me. It's not to say that like, oh, you know, I'm vain and I think I'm wonderful. But if someone says something mean about me, I'm like, I know that my intention wasn't that and I'm not, you know, it doesn't hurt me as much as it probably used to. So I think really looking after yourself is important. I think when you are feeling great, you know, when you're looking after yourself with what you eat and how you train, you feel better, your mood's better. You know, movement, daily movement helps with depression, helps with anxiety. So I think that's really important. Um, I think the other thing is just reminding yourself that this is all our first time on this planet we're all learning, we're all growing. And I remind myself of that daily. Like nobody grew up and was really successful in what they did or got it right the first time. I love making mistakes. I love growing. And I think the people that I surround myself with are people that inspire me. Every single one of my friends I learn from in some area of my life. And I think, yeah, confidence just comes from that. I love that so much. And it's good to, a good reminder that your journey is never linear and never. highs and lows, but those lows make you catapult yep. up because you can grow. And like sometimes when I see my friends going through a breakup and a massive low, I'm just like in a few weeks or a few months or however long it is, you are just going to be your best version of yourself because you're about to grow so much. Yeah, and so it's I, an opportunity for it's it. It's an opportunity and I love yeah. that little reminder and it's so good for whether you're – in a growth period or a low period, it's like there's just so much life to live. And one thing I've noticed about being in Australia, we're obviously got tall poppy syndrome here. One thing that I feel like people really struggle to say, and even with me, sometimes when I say it or think it, I get a bit choked up, but it's like to say I'm proud of myself. And so I feel like I'm one of those people that is always moving 
the bar post. Like I'm always moving the post. It's like if I say I want to achieve this, I never sit in that moment and go, wow, how amazing I just achieved this and move on to the next thing. But that's sad also. And so I try (laughs) to bring myself back and remind myself and then look at things that I did and remind myself that five years ago that was a dream. And you're great with goal setting and things like that. But I think goal setting is a great way of being able to just look at how far you've grown and seeing yourself grow, get, getting confidence in knowing, hey, I am competent, I am good at this, I can move forward. I think as well last week Yana's talked about this idea of banking your wins and like seeing your life as a bank account and it's like amazing. Like mm. if you did your meditation that morning, bank that win, like be yeah. proud of the little things and the big things. Like obviously for us, like if you book a campaign, like that bank that win and be proud. But I also think there's so much importance in seeing the next thing and like, striving Definitely. but I one of these big things that I've learned kind of as late since I've like moved in with Tom and gone the dog it's like being since con- you started adulting I know I've been <laughs> adulting um but I feel like being content is the most amazing place to be oh, but everything. old me would have I literally had arguments with people because I thought being content was you weren't dreaming big enough like you didn't have goals but I've come to realize that content is the sweet spot yeah your energy is beautiful at the moment Dom was someone that was always on to the next thing what's that and you are you're very content now and I think it's when you're like living your purpose and yeah I think as well I have so many mentors now in my life and they've just done stuff to serve and it and it always works out if you're doing a good, a good thing. Um, I think another thing on the point of confidence was my mum, bless her, but she always brought me up to be individual. And so I am so comfortable being the only one in the room that's wearing something different to everyone else. I'm so comfortable being the only one in the room that has a different opinion to everyone. And I think that being different is what colours the world. And so I think when we start comparing ourselves to other people, you're never going to be the best of every single area and there are areas that you shine in. And so learning to go, you know what, like I'm really, really athletic or I'm a really, really good cook and being proud of that and, you know, using like leaning into that and going this is something about me that I can celebrate instead of focusing on everything you don't have because if you're constantly doing that, constantly going to be letting yourself down. There are things that I'm better than you at. There are things that you're better than me at. That's life. And I think I love that as well because it's learning that there's unlimited success in this world. So like mm-hmm. if someone else succeeds, it doesn't take away any success from you. It's like be excited for everyone around you. Yeah. And I think that use comes it with, as an inspiration. Use it as an inspiration and like celebrate with them. Yeah. And I think there's not enough of that around. Yeah. And I think when you're talking about comparison, that sort of idea of just like celebrating your friends, celebrating your family, celebrating everyone is so important. And that energy you put out will come back to you. So it's like you're celebrating your friends, then they're going to celebrate you. And then you feel better about yourself. And it's just this big, and also, nice, happy little circle that we can both be in. But if you're sitting in your room going, I hate that that person got that job, well, then you're manifesting negativity in your yeah. life and you get on this negative flow state. So, yeah, I really I really loved all those tips. I definitely think anyone can take them on. I can talk. I just threw about 20 at you. Yeah, then. I love him. I love him. <laughs> um, well, you are mentioning before training, eating, all these things are really important to you. That's why it was kind of a shock to me when you opened up to me about having Hashimoto's disease. I wanted to talk and I wanted to ask you, sorry, how did you find out you had this? Like what's the journey with it been? Just the first part about the shock of it. For me it was I'm, I have this whole, my whole mantra in life is like we have, you have one life, one body. I treat my body like a temple, as you know, like I really look after myself. She like never drinks alcohol. <laughs> like she literally is the epitome of health. <laughs> and so when I did get diagnosed, I was pretty upset because I just thought like, it's not fair. Like, you know, I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing. And it was this sense of, I guess I've got a science background. So I always think there's a reason for everything and you can fix everything. And I was sitting there and I was just trying to look for a reason or an answer. And it was, it was quite hard. Um, but the way that I got diagnosed and with a lot of people with autoimmune diseases is it's, it's quite a long process and I'm very, very in tune with my body and I started noticing changes very early on and I would go and see doctors and they would sort of tell me, no, you're fine. And a lot of the symptoms of Hashimoto's can just be normal life symptoms to some people. Um, they're just a little bit more extreme. So when you go to a doctor and you say, I'm really tired, well, everyone's tired. You know, how do you measure something like that? Um, and so I 
basically fatigue was my big issue a long time ago. But I've also got a genetic disorder. Um, so th- everything that I have causes fatigue. So it's kind of hard to know what's bad. But there was a period of time where I could literally stay awake for two hours and I'd need to sleep again and I'd nap and then I'd get back up again. Um, but all of those little issues started. And then if I had have dealt with this the way that I would, if I had the knowledge back then, I probably would have made a lot of changes in my life 10 years ago or however long ago it was, they picked up that my body had a lot of inflammation. Um, But in Western medicine, they sort of wait for you to get that inflammation to cause an autoimmune disease and then they treat that disease. So there's probably changes I could have made back then, but I was like, okay, great. Well, I've got all this inflammation in my body, but I'm still healthy. And then over the last three years, the changes just started going like this and I was, I'll get emotional, but I was quite emotional because I felt like I had, I guess, no control over my own body. Um, And with autoimmune, you really need to become, and with any condition or anything with your body, you know your body better than anyone else. You need to become your own health advocate. You need to be there at the doctors. And so the number of doctors and specialists that I saw and the amount of money that I spent before I got diagnosed with Hashimoto's um, is just, you know, so um, basically had all these changes happening in my body. Like I put on five kilos basically overnight and because I'm tall, I hold it well or whatnot, but I'd go to the doctors and I'd be like, things like this are happening. I am so tired. Um, and with Hashimoto's, if it's not treated, it, it can kill you. Wow. So it's something that you do need to get on top of. Um, a lot of people, their hair starts falling out their skin starts becoming and you know you look in the mirror and you're like something's not right and especially but with to what a you doctor do. yeah. or even to a friend if you say hey my hair's a bit thin they're not gonna see that um and so yeah then I ended up getting diagnosed with it and then the next step is trying to get medication right um and I can say in the three why I'm emotional but in the last month and I said to you even today when I saw you, I'm finally me after like three solid years. Yeah, and I can't even imagine like especially as we were talking about your your career and being in the spotlight and like, you know, having to – like you are your brand. Yeah. So it's really hard when those symptoms start happening and like how you view yourself. I'm oh, sure it was 100%. difficult. And one of the side effects of um, Hashimoto's is actually anxiety because your heart, everything's racing because um, basically it just slows down. It is – it slows down your metabolism and basically your whole body's just struggling. And so even with things like that, like because I do have a psychology background, I am mentally very strong. But I always think with any mental condition or any mental health issues, there is two parts to it. There's the 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 side of your body, the physiological side, like your heart racing, you your stomach feeling nervous, all of that. And then there's the mental side and they do feed into each other. But I, I can sometimes feel my heart's racing and I feel like something must be wrong, but my head's okay. So it's been, honestly, it's a really good month for me. I'm like, finally, she's back. Yay. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. And I could tell when you walked in the door, such a shift from the last time you walked in my door. Yes. So I was really happy to see that and um you know I think it's a really good story and it's to be in tune with your body and like listen to your body it's yeah. giving you sign I feel like in modern society we've been toned to just dial down yeah like don't well, symptoms are information well it's like you've got a headache mask it you, you yeah you know just take Panadol or whatever it is we're just told to just keep going keep going but your body is telling you and like you need to fight for yourself because even like I know people that have had chronic headaches for years and I'm like If you've had these headaches for years, if you go see a doctor, if the doctor tells you it's nothing, see another doctor. And I'm like a Google doctor queen, but I literally will look up my symptoms. If there's something that keeps going, I take photos of everything. I note down things. You know, if I notice a change in my body, I've got a date that it's happened. I've got an image of something that's not right. So when I go to the doctor, I'm like, here you go, this, this, and this. I've already looked up things that it could be online because that's the thing with autoimmune diseases. There's like... 80 or so of them that um, – and you don't know which one you're going to get. The symptoms are so random. A lot of doctors aren't even aware of some of them. Um, but I look up things that it could possibly be and then I say, okay, could you test this? And like I said, symptoms are in your body giving you information that something's not right. So if there's something that isn't right, keep fighting for it. Have you seen a naturopath about this? Yeah, so I've basically – I have seen every health professional you could possibly see but I've now got a new doctor um, and she's working on basically everything. 
Amazing. So, and that's the thing with autoimmune, you can kind of, I'm attacking it from all around and that's why I think I'm feeling good. Yeah, I think um, having like a functional doctor and someone who's looking at, obviously you need prescription and things like yeah. that for what you have. Yeah. Um, but I think the natural remedies are amazing tools as well. So it's good to know that you, you're going through all, anything, every doctor, <laughs> whatever you can. We're attacking it from every I do not want to look at your bank account. <laughs> I really don't because I know how much these things can really add up. Look, you know what they do, but it, for me I'm like – what price do you put on health? And I, my thing is always is the earlier you attack something, the better it is. Absolutely. You know, I'm not in hospital. I'm not having to deal with those sort of medical bills. And, yes, it's a bit much here, but in the long run it will pay itself off. Absolutely. I love that mindset. I wanted to kind of touch on your diet since getting diagnosed. We were kind of talking about how we're glu- both gluten-free and dairy-free now. I know personally that me having this style of eating comes with a bit of judgment. Yeah. Um, but I'm so well aware of myself and I see now how everyone eats eating processed sugar, um, ultra processed food, refined sugar, drinking all the time. I'm like, we've actually gone so far back of how we're meant to eat. So the judgment doesn't hit me anymore. But how about you? How are ways that you combat that? <sighs> Look, I am <laughs> about one month now. <laughs> gluten and dairy free. We I haven't <laughs> been told that I have to do it forever. The doctors just got me trying it. I was petrified. I am a <laughs> European girl. I love my food. I love my pasta. It doesn't mean you can't have it. Just and me, me and gluten were friends. Like I don't, I don't, have, <laughs> <laughs> I don't me have, gluten were friends. <laughs> I don't have bloating. I didn't have those sort of symptoms. Um, but obviously when you have autoimmune, something ain't working and you've got to work out what your trigger is. So we're trying that at the moment. And I will say it is something I've been petrified of and it is not hard. At home, I have no issues at all. It stops me from cutting corners. It's just, you know, basically I can eat anything. I just have to make it, you know. And there's obviously there's great places you can go to and you can get all your different ingredients. But it's like say something like a cake. I can still have a cake. Acai, no issues. Love that for me. If I had to give up acai, I probably would not. And to be honest, like... Gluten-free granola and acai actually slaps because it's got more nuts and seeds. It's like better protein, but it, helps but with the glucose in, spikes. But even in saying that, it's like you it's like with anything, you just gotta find a brand of something that you like. So that's been okay. I will say judgment wise, I struggle a lot um being like I was quite thin growing up. And, you know, a lot of the time people will comment on what you eat, you know. I'm a big eater. And people will always comment on that. But say, for an example, I go out at night and I don't have my bread roll. Someone will say, don't you eat bread? I do eat bread. I'm just not having it tonight. And so for me, I didn't want to be that difficult person that has to say I can't have this or that. And so it wasn't until the doctor told me to try it. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. Um, And a few people comment more in terms of saying, oh, no, you can have that. Like say, for example, hot chips. Potatoes aren't gluten. But then I wish I was like, I'll be fine. I can still have chips. But when you go out... They can be cooked in oil that has gluten in it and you're not allowed to have that. So sometimes people will be like, no, you can have chips. And I'm like, no, I need to ask the staff. They know what is cooked in and whatnot. Um, so the judgment, I guess that part of it I thought would be hard. The biggest thing that I've noticed, and I was so guilty of it, like Domi's the, pretty much the only one in our group with dietaries. dietaries. Yeah, it's annoying when you're the only person, but I feel like... But I didn't realise, like, we go out. <laughs> and so, like, say we're all sitting there and... Especially like if we've got someone in the group that's like like that, sorry, or is a vegan and they'll say, oh, okay, like Dom might go, oh, well, I'll get the pumpkin then. Her pumpkin comes out and we all share the pumpkin between 10 people. And it's like I love like I also enjoy like I eat meat but I also enjoy like vegetarian options. So if someone orders a vegetarian dish, I'm like, oh, I'll try that. And the other day we went out for lunch and it was my first one and no one realised. But like I said, this girl can eat and everyone was sharing our dishes. And so like I came home and I've had like, you know, one little thing of something. And I was like, I never think about that in a situation when someone else on the table is that. Yeah, that's actually a good point. I feel like <laughs> I'm pretty used to it now and I navigate and like often You're before. You're so chill, but I wanted to be like, that is my pumpkin. Get your fork out of it. That's all <laughs> well, I've like, got. Often before events, I like eat before. Like See, I'll never go that. too hungry because I know that that can often happen. I do that. But then when I'm around like people, I just need to keep eating. Do if you know, everyone else is eating, I want to eat. Do you know what the biggest perk is being a GF and DF girl? On Hit a plane, me. you get your food first. Oh, okay. okay. So you'll like see it. This. You don't have to wait and wonder. <laughs> you know you're getting your food first. 
Um, so now I wanted to kind of touch on your fitness. As it, as I mentioned at the start, Laura's got a cert three and four. What would be your advice to someone who's just starting their fitness journey? Just do it. Honestly. <laughs> no, honestly, it's, I'm like, again, my mum is my, my mum is a wellness warrior. She has taught me absolutely everything and she was doing it before it was cool. But my mum had me like when I was like 16 or whatever, she was going to the gym. She's like, come on. So I went to the gym with her and I did weights. And I remember as like a 16 year old being so embarrassed that people could see me and whatnot. But I got rid of that embarrassment then. So to say that the first time you walk into a gym, you're not going to be embarrassed isn't true. But know that we all had that day. We all felt like that. Nobody's looking at you going, what is she doing with the weights? Um, Even when you know what you're doing. Like I I said, you know, I've got my Cert 3 and 4 in PT. I still train with trainers and learn from them. And amongst the trainers that I train with, they will tell me to change my technique in a certain way because somebody likes me to elevate my heels when I squat. Someone tells me to take a wider stance when I squat. Somebody tells me to go deeper because I'm not hitting the full range. Someone else tells me don't go to the full range and you're arching your back when you do. So no one knows whether you're doing it wrong, right, whatever. There are people in there that are so well trained that look like they're doing it wrong. Um, So I think get that out of your head. I think there's so many great brands at the moment that have really good programs. I love a program just because it keeps everything moving. My friends, the Base Body Babe, I have their program. And if you're uncomfortable, it's on your phone. They've got little videos of what you do. Everyone in their break sits on their phone and has a look. So pretend you're having a look at something. You can literally have a look at what to do. It'll tell you the weights to do, what weights to put on, how many reps and away you go. Um, But I just think it's something that like you – just being stronger in life – So for me, I've always had a lot of lower body strength. I do lots of running. I do marathons, that sort of thing. But I never had much upper body strength. And so, you know, like I now, if someone's like needs to lift something or carry something, I'm like, hit me. And I love it. I love being able to do that. Yeah. And I I kind of reminded me of that saying, the best time to start was yesterday, but the second best day is today. Yeah. And it's like, stop putting it off. And one of the tips I love is just that idea of just do it. So whether you go to the gym and you walk on the treadmill for five minutes. Do that till you get comfortable. But after five (laughs) minutes, you're probably like, oh, maybe I'll go do five minutes on the floor and do some abs or, and then you've done a workout. So you probably want to nourish yourself properly because you're like, yeah, you know, it's a really, yeah, it's a good flow on effect. And that's the thing that you could, something simple like a treadmill, go walk on the treadmill and get used to being in the space move to body weight exercises. Then you can move to weighted things. There's classes. Like there's so many things out there that you can do. And we're all different. All of our bodies are different. All of our cardio levels are different. All of our strength levels are different. You'll find an area in that that you thrive in and it'll feel, you know, easy. So we both just say, just do it. Yeah. And I think that the big, a big thing as well is surround yourself with people that have that mindset all of my friends, like uh, they've got, they're quite healthy. And so like, even with us, like we don't really go for dinner. <laughs> we go for a walk. Well, we have a sahi, yeah. we have a sauna. Like it's like when you're around people like that and your lifestyles of that, you end up doing more training than you thought you were going to mm. because you've already trained for the day and someone goes, do you want to go for a walk? And you're like, oh yeah, let's go for a walk. Well, yeah, I feel like it kind of comes with age, which is really nice. It's yeah. like one of the things I've realized when it comes to making plans with people, I'm so happy just going for a walk like it doesn't have to always be alcohol to give me liquid yeah. confidence and talk to people xyz so yeah. and if you are someone who doesn't have a group of healthy people around you maybe join a run club yeah. pilates i've made so many friends at pilates like literally yeah it's crazy i when i walk in there it's family to me um well and that's I, like i've done like a lot of moving and i had to i lived in france for a little bit i lived in melbourne i lived in queensland and all of my friends came from a gym. Hundred, it's the and best I got place. so good because it's it's hard to make friends when you're older. And literally, you go to the gym, and then everyone's working out, and then someone goes, "Oh, should we go get a smoothie after?" Yeah. And then next thing, you're hanging out with a group of people, and you know, it just goes from there. And that's what I mean. Like once you start looking after yourself, you meet beautiful people, and there's so many benefits. Your your mind is more clear. Like everything flows on from that. So yeah, just move. I wanted to kind of touch on what are your favorite post workout snacks because you post a lot of like yummy bowls with nut butters and things like you're so inspirational when it comes to the kitchen what's your favorite pre-workout and post-workout well I don't like to train on an empty stomach I literally I get like nauseous if I do so I eat 
quite a lot before I train. Um, don't know that that's recommended for everybody, but it's what works for me. I think that's a good tip as well. Like it's super bio-individual. Yes. Like I've started just having half a banana before I train because yeah. I cannot train with a lot in my belly. Like if I'm jumping rope and I can feel food in my stomach, I'm like, ugh. So I go, I do Common Ground Rum Club on a Saturday morning and before that, because that starts quite early for me, I'm not an early riser like this lady over here, um, because of that I'll have a banana and a banana is great, perfect for a pre-workout. But for all my other training, I have usually have protein oats um, with berries and honey and You can't have oats it. anymore. I can. Oh. I've got a gluten-tested lady. It's funny. I was at these markets one day and I was trying these amazing nut butters. Like I'm telling you next level. Oh, I can't even. They've got like a Nutella spread. And the girl was like, you actually went to my school. So she's got a company called the Whole Foods Refillery and they have gluten-tested oats. They've got like wow. everything. So that's, yeah, I can't be without I was going to say, that's a, that would be the one thing for you because I always see you having your oats. I know. I've had to switch up my protein. So for a vegan. I'm, yep, vegan. Are you so doing a pea protein or? I'm doing, so I was, I love Bear Blends. Um, Same. Yeah. And so I've got their one now, but we'll look to see how we go on my journey. And post-workout. Post-workout, I it just depends really. A, a smoothie's great. I like to get protein, like 30 grams of protein into me straight after a workout ideally. Um, so if I'm on the run, I literally will just have it in a little shaker. If I'm actually at like going somewhere, I'll have like a smoothie or something like that. Um, I'm really loving eggs at the moment. That's when you, yeah, when you go off the dairy and the gluten, <laughs> it's like eggs a lot. But I think I got salmonella a couple months ago, so I have not eaten eggs. But Sorry since. to bring that up right now. <laughs> I I don't know if I want to say this on the podcast, but I was do on it, set. I was, I was on set for a job, right? And for breakfast, I got three eggs, avocado, tomato. And then for lunch, I got Cali press. And because the gluten-free bread's small, I thought I'd order two portions. That so I got four pieces of bread, each with two eggs. And I ate all the, I only had two pieces of bread, but all the eggs. So that's seven eggs in one day, like gains, but also salmonella the next day. Anyway, do you know what's funny about that is that I honestly like too much of a good thing and good for you. I haven't eaten them since. I had too I many avocados in school. I used to have like a whole avocado every day. I, I have them. a whole avocado every day I still. Own- as a little child, though, I don't think yeah, that's my, great. No, but me and my mum, we have we take the pip out. We put that's what I used to do with a spoon. Yeah, and it must I be a walk it. thing. And I got um, <laughs> I got sick of too many avocados. I just had to have a little break and then she was back again. You're back, you're back for sure. Yeah. Or maybe I'll get back on the eggs. Yeah. <laughs> I just picture everyone picturing me with eggs and I'm, like, mortified. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to end the pod because you've obviously had so much – it sounds like you've had so much experience, obviously, with, like, Miss Universe, your autoimmune disease – um, confidence, what would be some advice you would have told your younger self? Stress less, honey. Oh, <laughs> amen to that. Just enjoy life, you know, and it's – I feel like – there's no better place than where you're at right now. Mm. And it's so easy to look and be like, oh, I wish that I was older and this and this was happening for me. Or to then look back and go, I wish I had have done this better or whatnot. And it's like, you're exactly where you're meant to be. Life is a journey. Ride it. I love that. Yeah. Well, Laura, you are so inspiring. So are I'm you, so my girl. grateful <laughs> that you came on the pod. If you don't follow Laura, make sure you follow her at Laura Dundavik. She- I rap. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. she'll throw some weird shit up there. You might love it. You might hate it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I love do. all Go your on. stuff. You're a powerhouse. Thank you, you so much for getting on the pod with me. A little reminder, if you can like the episode, share it, subscribe, it really means so much to me. At the moment... The, we've got double the amount of listeners as we do subscribers. So if you can just go and click follow, I'd be so, so grateful because I want to make this podcast as good as I can. And with that, I'll see you on the next episode. Bye.